Hey there, I'm excited to announce this to you today. This is what you've been waiting for in your spiritual quest. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and I'm finally ready to announce it that it's ready to go. It's the Grief to Growth Community Circle. Now, this is a sanctuary where like-minded souls are united in their journey through grief and towards personal transformation. It's more than just a place. It's a beginning. It's a commitment to growth and understanding. Here you're finding not just a community, but you're entering a circle of trust and depth. You're going to engage with interactive coursework. You'll dive into exclusive podcast episodes and partake in discussions that illuminate the path from mourning to empowerment. This is a realm where every question is honored and every individual's journey is validated. To be part of this exclusive circle, visit us at grieftogrowth.com slash community or look for the chat icon at the bottom of every page on the main website. Remember that entry is a privilege because I want to ensure that every member is as dedicated and genuine as you are. You must apply to join, but the journey within is worth every step. So go ahead and join us today. Check it out, grieftogrowth.com slash community, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hi there. Welcome to Grief to Growth Podcast. Your host is Brian Smith, spiritual seeker, best-selling author, grief survivor, and life coach. Brian believes that the worst tragedies of life provide the greatest opportunity for growth. Brian says he was planted, not buried, and he is here to help you grow where you've been planted by the difficulties in life. In each episode, Brian and his guests will share what has helped them to survive and thrive. It is his sincere hope this episode helps you today. Hey, everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And I've got with me today, John Davis. And uh, John had a near-death experience we're going to talk about today. I'm going to read a short introduction, and then we're going to have a conversation. Uh, John had a life-changing near-death experience when he was 21 years old. And as a result, John has never been afraid of dying. In fact, he said he looks forward to it so he can be with the loved ones who have crossed before him. So um, what I want to do with John today is just have John kind of share what led up to your near-death experience, and why it is you no longer fear death since you had it. So, John, welcome to Grief to Growth. Thank you, Brian. It's a delight to be here. I'm so yeah. excited. Yeah, I talked to you once before. It was several months ago. You presented to Helping Parents Heal, and your, your experience was really fascinating. So if you would, just um, start wherever you'd like. If you want to start before what led up to it or start in your experience, just, just take it from there. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the whole rundown. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was at my parents' house one weekend and I was riding one of their mopeds something we did every single weekend. It was, it was fun and it was no big deal. And as I was riding it one summer afternoon, I turned a corner really fast and there was a squirrel sitting in the middle of the road. So in order for me to avoid hitting the squirrel, I made this huge right turn and I crashed into a tree. And I hit in such a way that I had to have the tendons on my right hand surgically surgically reattached to the bone. Mm. So the day of the surgery comes, and I have never had a surgery before. I had never had any kind of anesthetic before. So this was all new to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm laying on the table, and they tell me that they're going to give me a shot, and that's going to knock me out so they can do the surgery. So as they started to give me the, the anesthesia through my, through my veins, I could feel it going through my body, up through my arms, into my shoulders, down through my neck, and then my chest, and then to my heart. In the very second that it hit my heart, my heart stopped. I had some kind of allergic reaction to the anesthesia. So the very second that I shut my eyes and died, the very next second, it seemed like, I opened up my eyes and I was standing in the most beautiful, perfect marble building that I could ever imagine. And I'm going to have to, you're going to have to try to visualize with me on this because I've tried to describe this before and it's so hard to describe all of what I saw. So I'm going to try to do the best I can with it. So I was standing in the middle of this building. And it was a marble-like corridor. 
And as far down as you could see, you, you couldn't see an end to this corridor. On the left-hand side were these beautiful, ornate doorways or tunnels that looked like they had been cut out of the marble. Absolutely pristine and perfect doorways. To the very right of those doorways, about four feet, there were these tables. They, again, they were marble tables, and they each had four benches around the table, so people could sit at each end of the table, and they were square. I also have to mention, too, that during this whole process, there was somebody who was standing next to me, who was talking to me in my left ear. I never saw this person, but throughout my whole near-death experience, it was a guy it was a, it was a guy who was standing next to me telling me what I was seeing and what I was looking at, because I had absolutely no idea. Right about this time, as I was seeing this, he told me this was an orientation center. And I didn't think at the time anything about that I was having surgery or that I had an allergic reaction and that I had died. That didn't even occur to me. I was totally simply engrossed in what I was seeing. And so I just listened. I just listened all the way through this whole this whole story. Mm -hmm. And he told me this was an orientation center. There was, there were people, two people sitting at each one of these tables as far down as you could see two people, either two men, two women, men and women, it didn't matter. Mm. My guide told me to walk over and look inside the first doorway or the first tunnel. So I walked over and I looked in the tunnel and what I could see was just absolutely breathtaking. Inside the tunnel, I could see stars, like as if I was looking out on a, on a night, nighttime sky. I could see these stars, and I could see planets, and I could see galaxies. It was absolutely a magical experience. Mm -hmm. That is a tunnel that people come through when they die. And they cross over to the other side. Hmm. That's the kind of, those are the tunnels that they take. Okay. So my guide then said, look up to your left and look at the next doorway. So I looked up to the next doorway and there was a man that was coming through and he had his right arm on his left chest. Like hmm. what you do when you might have chest pain. Okay. Or you have like a heart attack, you'll put your hand on your chest. And my guide said he had died from having a heart attack. He looked very dazed. He looked very confused about what was going on. Hmm. So the woman that was right in front of his doorway stood up. She walked over and she took his hands and hers. And she walked over and she sat him down across from her at this table. And I could see that she was talking to him, but I was too far away to see what she was actually saying. Okay. Well, all of a sudden my guide said, he said, watch what happens to him. And this man who had come through, he was probably in his eighties. And my guide said that he had had a, he had died from having a heart attack. So he died. He came through the tunnel. When he got to the edge of the tunnel, he saw these two people sitting at this marble table. So she was holding his hands, talking to him. And as I was watching him, his appearance began to change. He was an 80-year-old man when he came through the doorway. Mm -hmm. But as he was talking to this counselor, he became younger and younger until he was probably in his late 20s or early 30s. Hmm. Her job as an orientator was to help people remember that they have just finished a lifetime and that they're home now. And whether you want to call it heaven or you want to call it the other side, mm. that's our, that's our true home. Mm. That's where we exist for eternity. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely amazing. So when she was done talking to him and he was back to his old self, either 20 or 30, he stood up like he was finished. 
he walked over to the right of the door of the of the table and he walked down three marble steps and i could see all of this he walked down these three marble steps to a garden and I know people have described the gardens on the other side that they're absolutely beautiful, but they are. They mm. are so hard to describe how beautiful they really are. Flowers and plants and bushes and trees and, and the grass. The gardens were almost like they were alive, mm. just absolutely beautiful. What was happening to this man is as he walked down those three steps and he walked into the garden, there were people there, a lot of people, and they were there to greet him from coming back from his life. They were hugging him, kissing him, welcoming him home, saying, what a great job you did. You did great. Now you're back home again. And that was absolutely unbelievable to me that when we die, we go through a tunnel we have an orientation if we need it. And sometimes people don't need the orientation because they are much closer to the other side than others, especially kids. When kids cross over, they don't need to have an orientation because they just came from there. Mm. The orientation is for people who, who may have lived a long, long life and had forgotten where they really came from. Wow. And so that's where those counselors really come into play. And it was fantastic. I wish I could describe to you what it looked like. But as I looked down this corridor, there were people coming through the corridors, through these tunnels, all the way down this entire corridor. It was very busy. People were passing over. People were crossing over all the time. And these counselors would get up and help them and bring them back to these tables and help get them orientated. And my guide told me that this was an orientation center. And it was only one of the different kinds that are there. I guess he didn't have time to show me the rest of them. Okay. Wow. Okay. But that was called the orientation center. Mm -hmm. And now from, from now on, what I'm going to share with, with you are the different places that he took me to mm -hmm. on the other side. The next thing he took me to was a building. And every time he took me somewhere, he showed me the outside first before showing me the inside. So the building he took me to next was a, a, under the Greco Roman building with white columns, beautiful white Grecian Roman columns out front. And they were formed in a circle with a dome on top. So if you can picture that in your mind, that's what it looked like. So a circular building with, with columns all around it? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Those okay. beautiful marble columns. Mm -hmm. and they had a dome on top. So then we walked in, and he told me, my guide said, this is where we plan our lifetimes. Because all of our lives go through a planning process. And we plan them with our main guides before we come into life. So that life isn't... It's not just a random accident. There's purpose. There's reason. There is a drive behind every lifetime that we lead mm. to, learn, to learn lessons and to grow from. When I first walked in, there was a table, and he was standing by it, and there were two scrolls on the table. One had a blue ribbon on it, and the other one had a red ribbon on it. And I didn't know what these were at first. My guide said, these are your scrolls that you write the major points of your lifetime on. And everybody has these scrolls. These are the kind of scrolls that everybody writes down where they're going to live, what kind of life they're going to have, what their parents are going to be like. Are they going to go to school? Are they going to go to college? What's their career going to be? Are they going to have a lot of money? Are they going to have a little bit of money? All of that is prepared ahead of time on these scrolls. So I walked over and I went to unscroll or I picked up the blue scroll and I, un, I took off the ribbon and I opened up the scroll on the table. And I could see that it was written in black calligraphy writing. Mm -hmm. And when I tried to read it, all of a sudden the scroll folded back up again. And my guide said, I'm not allowed to read that until I finish this lifetime. 
but he was trying to show me that our lives aren't an accident, mm. that every, everything is actually planned out for a reason. And I thought that was just absolutely fascinating. So it's planned out, but when we come here, we forget it. We forget the plan. It's, that's exactly yeah. that's exactly correct. Okay. He said he said we forget it because if we knew what we were supposed to do, we wouldn't be testing ourselves. Yeah. On the other side or in heaven, everything there is absolutely perfect. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful and it's perfect and it's hard to experience learning something. Like if you were supposed to go through a breakup, to learn what it was to go through a breakup and have forgiveness, for example. Mm-hmm. You can't really do that on the other side because there's no negativity. There is no such thing over there as a breakup. Hmm. You just don't want to see each other anymore. You just simply say that, but there's no, there's no animosity. Not all the emotion. And not, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That only exists here. Okay. Anyway, it's, it's, it was absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So the next thing he took me to what was the other was, scroll? Was it, you said there was another scroll? Did you? It was, there was another one there, and I couldn't see. I didn't open up that one. Okay, okay. Because he was actually taking me one place to another so okay. quickly. Mm-hmm. We were just we were just going place to place. The next thing he took me to was the largest building I had ever seen. Again, it looked like it was marble, and I can still remember looking down this marble at the outside of the building. And it was so long, you could not see the end of it. Mm. Well, I didn't know what this building was until he took me inside. When I got inside this building, I could tell it was a library. It was the most beautiful, ornate library I I had, had ever seen. There were people walking around, people sitting down at tables and chairs. People were looking for books. And this was so strange for me because right about this time during my experience, I was starting to think something must have happened and I died (laughs) because, you know, I know that they don't have anything like this at the hospital. Wow. Yeah. So I, I thought, okay, something really must be going on here, but I didn't think to ask any questions. I just looked at all the people that were, that were busy doing all these things they wanted to do. And they, were, they could actually, well, when I was, when I was growing up, I, I grew up a Catholic. Mm-hmm. And when I was growing up, I had always thought that when you died, you were just a ball of energy and that you existed somewhere, but that you didn't have any kind of presence or any kind of shape. I just thought you were a a ball. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody there looks exactly like we do. Okay. They they have, they have substance. Yeah. Everything everything over there has substance. If you want to sit down, you pull a chair out just like you do here and Mm -hmm. you sit down and it's solid. Your body is solid. The tables around you, everything is solid just like it is here, but it's a different dimension. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey there, something I want to tell you about today. My podcast platform, Buzzsprout, has recently made it easier for me to allow you to support me financially. Go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash subscribe. That's grief, the number two growth.com slash subscribe. And once you're there, you can sign up to support me financially. Now you can do it for as little as $3 a month or of course, as much as you'd like. If you do that, you'll get access to bonus episodes and you'll see those in the regular feed. They'll have a lock on them. But when you become a subscriber, you'll actually get access to your own private feed and you'll be able to listen to the regular podcast along with the bonus podcast for the subscribers. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for sharing the podcast. I want to thank those of you who support me financially. Have a great day and on to the episode. Yeah, some people seem to have this belief that we just become like a, like you said, like a ball of energy, right? We're just floating around like these uh, disembodied blobs. So exactly. it's interesting when when I hear people say, "Yeah, you you do have a body, you can sit down." Yes, absolutely, you can do all of that. Okay. And so we're looking in the library, and he tells me now he wants to take me to 
the left hand side of the library. So we're going over there and he shows me on the left hand side are these rooms, just like our libraries now have study rooms that you can go into. Mm -hmm. The library on the other, other side also have these study rooms. So he showed me one of them and you would step down about two or three feet into a sunken type of living room. That's what it looked like. Mm -hmm. There was a woman sitting there. She had her back to me. She had long, dark, flowing hair down to her waist. And she was watching something that looked like it was a, a flat screen TV. I'm sure that's not what it was, but that's what it looked like to me when I was mm -hmm. watching. Sure. And he said, look at what she's watching. So I looked over there and she was watching on this TV screen. She was watching a battle that had happened between the Native American Indians and the American cavalry hmm. some 200 years ago. She was watching live history. And I asked this person, I, I'm assuming it was a guy that was with me. I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Assuming it was a guide, I asked him, please explain to me how is it possible that she can be watching something that happened 200 years ago when we didn't even have video cameras back then? Yeah, right. Yeah, how, how could she be watching this? Mm -hmm. And he said that everything that you experience in Earth, everything is recorded by God. And I had absolutely no idea how that was possible, mm -hmm. but, it, but it was. And it is possible to go back and look at any period of history anywhere at any time and see what really happened. So she was watching this, this Amer Native American battle. And here's the most amazing thing. Not only do you have, if you're interested in learning something, there are so many ways to learn and to grow. The other side for us, we, we don't just sit around playing harps. Hmm. We actually go to all these different things like going to classes, going to lectures, going to concerts, going to libraries. They're, the whole idea behind the other side is learning and growth. Hmm. Souls love to learn and they love to grow. And that's what happens a lot on the other side. Not that that's all you do. You do all kinds of things too, but you love, you love to learn and study and, and grow. And so a mm -hmm. lot of that goes on. Well, he told me that while we were watching this girl watch this video, he said that you're not limited to only watching. You can actually step in to living history on the other side. Mm. So let's say... Let's say, Brian, you had always loved studying the history of World War II. Mm -hmm. And you were always fascinated by the, normally, the Normandy landing in France. Mm -hmm. You could go to one of these rooms. You could pick up a chip, put it in what looked like a video machine. But I, I know it wasn't that. It was far more technology advanced than that. Mm -hmm. But you could put this chip inside this machine and all of a sudden, it would show you what happened during the Normandy, van during the Normandy advance in, in France. Mm -hmm. But only, not only that, but there's a place you can go where you can actually step in or walk into living history on the other side. Mm -hmm. So you could walk in there and you could actually be standing on Normandy Beach taking in the smells, the sights, the feelings, everything that happened during that battle. And that's what that's with anything. Hmm. You can do, do that with your own childhood. Did you ever see Star Trek where they had the holodeck? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was kind of like that. Yeah. Where you could, you could go back and you could see everything in history, every part of history that you wanted to see. Yeah. It was just, I was just amazed to learn that there are so many ways over there to learn things. And one of the favorite things people have is learning 
and gaining knowledge. That's wow. why this library, that's why this library was so big. Okay. And and he told me that there are libraries for everything. They have libraries for for um, the history of painting. They have libraries for the history of music. Hmm. Or libraries for history of of just plain old history of a certain time period. Yeah. Every everything that was recorded in in the past is there. Okay. So that was absolutely phenomenal. The library was just, I didn't want to leave because I wanted to sit there and watch and see what else you could see, but you can see everything. Yeah. So I, can next, you also revisit, you said, I think you mentioned this, can you revisit your own life? You know, like yeah. if you, you go back and see your own childhood or your, your children's when they were young. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. You can see all that. Yeah. And it's, it's all as real as real. It's just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. So the, the next thing, so that so that was the library building. The next thing he took me to was another large building. This one looked like a stadium. And it was a stadium that was covered. The roof was covered. It wasn't open. It was covered. Hmm. And what it was, but I walked in and there were thousands and thousands of seats in this planetarium. And you know what a planetarium is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Project so was, the, the universe or whatever on the ceiling, ceilings. So you can look up and see the stars and the planets. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what this was. Mm-hmm. So I walked in and there were thousands of seats. Everybody was gone. It was all empty. Mm-hmm. And this is the first time that I had heard a voice that was outside of the voice to my left ear, to outside of my guide's voice. Another voice said, Please sit down and we'll begin the show. So I sat down and all of a sudden, all the lights went off. I looked up at the ceiling and this other voice in the background said, and it it was almost like this person in the back was running the actual show and how the planetarium works because Mm -hmm. he said, please sit down and we'll get started. So he started it. And all of a sudden, up on the ceiling, all of our planets began to show up. Uranus, Jupiter, Mars, uh, Mm -hmm. Saturn, all of our planets. Mm -hmm. The voice said, when you look at the stars, meaning me and everybody on Earth, all of humanity, this is what you see. And it just showed our galaxy. Hmm. Then that disappeared. Then the voice said, when we look at the stars, meaning everybody who's on the other side, this is what we see. And all of a sudden, Brian, all of these different planets began to show up. Hmm. At at first, there were hundreds. Then there were thousands. Then hundreds of thousands of different planets showed up. Hmm. Some Some were brown, some were blue, some were green, some were orange, some were red. And the voice said, there is far more life in the universe than you can possibly know about. Hmm. And, my, and here's, the, here's what blew me away. Earth is not the only place that we can go to have a lifetime. Yeah, that's interesting. We, isn't it, though? Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating that we can go to other planets. People come to this planet because it's the hardest one of all. Hmm. This planet is negative. You have people die here. You have people get sick. You have accidents happen. You have wars. You have starvation. You have corruption. You have all of these negative things that happen on this planet. Hmm. Well, apparently, all these other planets don't have that. And in order to learn, in order to learn quickly people come to the earth to experience learning lessons and not all of them are pleasant. I mean, who wants I, I, if if you don't mind, I'd like to interrupt you there for just a second. I think it's a very important point. Um, You know, we, we have people talk about, you know, we all wish that earth was better, right? We all wish we could have heaven on earth. We all, we all wish we could not have these bad things happen to us. But what I hear you saying is we actually come here intentionally to experience these things that we call negative while we're here. Yep, exactly. And 
And the reason is, is because we can learn so much faster. Mm -hmm. There are people on the other side who don't want to come here. Mm -hmm. They'd rather just learn going to some other planet or going to some other world and having a life experience that way. But if you want to learn quickly and you want to advance your soul, you come to a place like this yeah. where, where sometimes it feels like everything is so heavy. And so yeah. hard. I think, John, I think right now, because I'm, I'm listening to my I'm thinking of my listeners and a lot of my listeners have, have had children pass. Yeah. So they're thinking, why would I plan this? Why would I come to a place where this happens? And I think about the racial stuff we're going through right now. And I think about coronavirus and people are saying, you know, why would I plan this? So how would you answer that? That's a hard one that I didn't see all the details about that, mm -hmm. but it's not when something like that happens to a family and the people are definitely it's distraught, it isn't necessarily them that plant that, that chose that it was mm -hmm. the person sick that chose it. Ah, yeah. Good point. So, yeah. And cause I didn't know what the reason was, but the reason this happens a lot of times is because the person who gets sick has chosen that for their lifetime yeah. to, to maybe teach others what it was like to experience that. Because in my life, the people that I, that I have lost, I have learned more from having that loss take place than I would have ever learned if I was on the other side. Mm. It takes thousands of years to learn what you can learn in a lifetime. So it's definitely not pleasant. It's not something you want to experience, yeah. but the is that we are here to learn lessons. And especially it is, I think it's the worst to lose a child. I have lost parents, friends, but I've actually never lost a child. We have mm -hmm. two, we have two teenage boys. And I think I would be hard tested to realize what it would, what I would have to do how strong I would have to be to be able to get through that. And I, I just don't know what I would do. Yeah. Well, I think, as you said, I think we, we plan, we plan our lessons and, you know, we think, and I think I love the point you made. We, we think, Oh, why would I have planned this? But we don't think, you know, the other people involved in this planning too. So maybe it's, maybe it's, they planned it for their, for their soul experience, you know? So there's, yeah. it's everything that we do impacts, you know, everybody else. It's not all just always about me. You know, how would I plan this? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly yeah. it. So, so, that was uh, what, so the planetarium, he was just trying to tell me that there are so many other worlds that exist. Mm -hmm. And here's the part that really got me fascinated was that we can incarnate and have lifetimes on those other planets. Yeah. We don't have to just come back to Earth. And the other planets have evolved way past having to deal with starvation or wars or corruption. None of that exists there. That just exists for the lucky ones that come to Earth. <laughs> yeah, well, this planet, you know, and that, that's, it, to me, it's like, yeah, this planet seems so primitive to me. You know, it's like you, you would think we'd be past this by now, but, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's just way by design. And as you're saying, I was thinking about, I was talking with someone about reincarnation the other day. And there was like, okay, well, you have to keep coming back to Earth over and over and over again. It's kind of nice to know that we don't have to come back here all the time. Exactly. You don't have to come back here at all if you don't want to. We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, growth.com, or text growth, growth, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth www.patreon.com slash g-r-i-e-f the number two g-r-o-w-t-h to make a financial contribution and now back to grief to growth 
Yeah. That's the neat thing. And the only reason people do is because like you've heard of near death experiences where the mom or the father is above their body, looking at their children. Mm -hmm. They're offered, they're offered the chance. Do you want to come back or do you want to stay? And almost all the time they want to stay to be with their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Just, they just want to be with their kids as much as they can. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely brutally hard to lose a child. But what parents forget is that many, many times that was charted by the child for something that they wanted to go through. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. So the planetarium part about that was, I think that was probably my most favorite part. Yeah. You can go to other worlds. You can see other planets. There are other, other places that don't have wars and don't have sicknesses and don't have kids who are dying that that only exists on this world. Mm -hmm. We finish this planet. Once we finish here, we don't have to come back unless we want to. Yeah. Well, that, have, that, it's really good to know for people that are struggling, that, that are struggling here and they hear about, I, I have a friend, we, I would mention reincarnation. She would literally start crying because she had had such a tough life. And she's like, I never want to come back to this place again. Please don't tell me I have to come back here again. She doesn't. Yeah. She and that's that's the most beautiful part about it is because you don't want to come back here and you don't have to come back here. There are so many other worlds to go to. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. So what was after the planetarium? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi there. I'm really excited to tell you about my latest ebook. It's four lessons that you can learn from the near-death experience without going through all the trouble of dying to learn them. I've been studying NDEs for several years now. I am completely convinced that not only are they 100% real, but that there's some very universal wisdom that we can get from the near-death experience. And I've distilled that down in this book into four short lessons. And I've also given you all the reasons why I believe that NDEs are absolutely real. So go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash NDE lessons to pick it up for free www.grief the number two growth.com slash NDE lessons. I hope you enjoy it. The planetarium, those were mostly the, the, the big buildings that he wanted to show me. Mm -hmm. After the planetarium, he took me to a beach and all of these things I want to share with you now, all these different buildings, these are things that people do on the other side for fun. Mm, okay. they, they enjoy learning they enjoy reading they enjoy painting or whatever they might love to do cooking all of it is done because they love it they don't have to do it because they have a job god has given everybody gifts and maybe your gift is singing maybe your gift is working on cars or maybe it's being a uh architect mm -hmm. your gift you can utilize on the other side as much as you want to and there's no other reason than doing it because you love it you just love doing that and that's your gift and that's why a lot of people here on earth strive or they know what they wanted to be when they were very young because they had programmed that like if a little girl comes in who knows from the age of seven or eight that she wants to be a nurse, then that is definitely a God-given gift for her, that she wants to come into earth, look at her potential, see what she can achieve with God's gifts, mm. and live life that way. And then when she gets back to the other side, she can still be a nurse. She can still do those things, mm -hmm. but you have to do it for work. Okay. Okay, the next thing he took me to was a beach and an ocean and he said we have many oceans here here is just one of them and this beach it was absolutely the most beautiful beach you could ever imagine it had white sand that was so pristine and it had ocean water that was so blue and so clear you could see all the way to the bottom of the ocean floor no matter where you were standing hmm. And when I touched down, the water was lukewarm. 
I just wanted to go jump in there mm. and just swim. It was so fantastic. Mm. And there were palm trees there. And it was the most beautiful beach I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of beaches growing up in California. Yeah. And this beautiful, gorgeous beach, there was nothing like it at home. There was nothing like it here on the earth. It was absolutely just fantastic. After the theater, he took me to, uh, all I can think of it is he took me to a meadow with beautiful flowing mountains or hills. And it was large. It was absolutely a beautiful hill. And all of a sudden, I saw animals come jumping down from that hill. And I said, what are these animals for? And he said, every one of these animals that you've ever loved or that anybody has ever loved is on the other side. Hmm. And I could see, and I, as I was standing there, I could see two of my dogs and I could see two of my cats running down the hill and all the animals play together until their loved ones from earth cross over to the other side and come back and get them. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, it was absolutely, and I started crying. It was such a feeling of unbelievable love that they're all there waiting for you and that they play with each other and that they're happy and they don't have cancer anymore. They don't have any kind of sickness anymore. They don't have disease. Mm. They stay like that for eternity, just like us. Yeah. We had cancer. We had some kind of disease that, that took us over. That doesn't stay with us on the other side because nobody dies. Nobody gets sick. Nobody ages over there. Everyone stays the same age, around 28 or 30. Hmm. So the animals were absolutely incredible. Then he took me to, oh, I do have more buildings. I forgot to mention this. He took me to a theater looking building uh -huh. just have here. Like you walk into a theater, you sit down and there's one big screen that you look at. Mm -hmm. He did that with me. We sat down and the screen, the screen came on and my guide said, this was, or he said, this is the past life screening room that you can actually go here. And you can take a look at it and see how many past lives you've had. And I was, at that point, I was a little bit skeptical because I didn't really believe anything about that. I'd never been told anything about that. Oh, okay. So the screen came on and he said, I'm going to show you three of your past lifetimes. One was of a monk. I was a monk with a shaved head. I was wearing a red gown like a monk wears, mm -hmm. sandals. And my job over there was to teach the children about the monasteries, hmm. and about Buddhism. When I first saw that one, I realized, okay, reincarnation is real. Hmm. I, I knew that was me. Yeah. Even, though, even though I didn't look the same, I could still see that that was me. Interesting. Yeah, it really yeah. was. Yeah. And the next he showed me was I was a wheelbarrow shoe repair person, something like that. I, I was I had a wheelbarrow. It was like in Russia somewhere or somewhere in Egypt that had cobblestone roads. Mm -hmm. And my job in that lifetime was to repair shoes. Interesting. I okay. Wheelbarrow and I was pushing it around with different shoes that I fixed for people in the, in the little area. So that was that life. The third one he showed me was a, was a, of a fisherman, a fisherman on a little raggedy boat that I would throw out the nets next to the boat and pull in the fish. Mm -hmm. And those were those three lifetimes in that building that he showed me. At that point, I realized, okay, I do believe in reincarnation. I absolutely yeah. believe. Then he took me to another building. And you have probably heard about this. This building, again, was round. It was a theater. 
when you walked in, it had seats everywhere. But the difference was that the theater had the screens all the way around the whole top of the theater. So it wasn't just one screen. Hmm. It was the 20 screens. And he told me what it was. He said, this is where you go when you review your lifetime. Oh, okay. So we, so we sat back and all of a sudden the screens came on and I could see myself as a little kid playing or doing the things that I did when I was little, interacting with my parents, going to school, meeting friends, doing everything on the weekends. And this, and this was all being played on these screens that were on top. Hmm. That's, so that's what's called a life review. And you get to actually have a life review and look at your life, look at the things that you did. Mm -hmm. No one judges you. God doesn't judge you, and you don't judge you. You and your guide sits down and looks at your life and looks at the things that you really thought you did well. Mm -hmm. And they also sit down and look at a lot of the things that you wish you could have done differently. But there's no judgment. And that's what I thought was so fascinating was that you can just come in review your life, every yeah. aspect of your lifetime to see how you did. And then you can go back and look at those scrolls and you can see how did you compare to the life that you lived to what you wanted to accomplish on the scrolls. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it, it can be really simple. It can be, I wanted to come into life because I wanted to learn patience or I wanted to learn how to love my kids or I wanted to learn how to how to be a better friend and they're very simple types of goals that we have mm -hmm. and those are goals that we have when we come into life yeah okay the next thing he took me to it was called the gardens and this was a place over there that was absolutely undescribable there were flowers for miles around that you could actually go to sit there and just smell the flowers. There were thousands upon thousands of rows of purple flowers, white flowers, red, orange, and there were other colors too that we have, that we don't have here. Hmm. And you can stand there and smell the aroma. You can smell it. You can, it's absolutely beautiful. And he said, people can go here when they want to come for meditation. So if you meditate in life, you can also meditate on the other side. Wow. So that was that. Mm -hmm. The other thing he took me to was what I would call the sports arenas. He took me to a place where there was so much green grass, so many sports fields that again, you couldn't see the end of how long these lasted. It was like going to watch a football game, but the grass never ended. It was, you could play any kind of sport that you wanted to play. You could play baseball, basketball, football, soccer, rugby, golf, anything you could play was over there on these sports fields. Hmm. And watching, I was watching these guys playing soccer and I wanted so badly to go jump in there and play soccer because your body feels great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you don't have any aches or pains. Yeah. Over there, you can't get sick and you can't break bones. We don't have to use lungs to breathe over there. We have a body just mm -hmm. like we do, but we don't have lungs to have to breathe. So the best thing is you don't ever grow tired. Yeah. You don't get tired there. And you can spend all of your time doing what you love to do. Visit with friends, visit with loved ones, take a walk with your dogs or your cats or paint or be a craftsman. You can be anything. It's absolutely fantastic. Now, I know we don't have to eat, but can we eat? Can we enjoy food? Yeah, we can. Okay. But we don't have to eat to sustain ourselves. Yeah. But we can. Because there are a lot of people here who love to cook. Yeah, I love to cook. Yeah. Oh, too. Yeah, you yeah. can cook over there. Yeah. Anything, anything you love to do here, 
you can do over there. You know, it's interesting, John, as we're, as we're, as we're having this conversation, I think about some people think, oh, when we go there, we're going to miss the stuff we have here. But I think it's, and we say, oh, and then you say, well, then we got the things there that we have here. I think maybe we have the things here that we have there. It's kind of like, true. this is, this is a, a reflection of, of there, of home. That is true because everything that comes here comes from the other side first. Right. Like our bodies, our bodies are even more perfect over there than they are here. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of the shadow. This is kind of, yeah. That's exactly it. That's exactly a good way to say it. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, the last thing that happened is my guide took me to this field and the field had knee high grass and wildflowers in it. Absolutely beautiful. And the smell of the flowers was incredible. So as I was standing there, another gentleman walked up. He was about two feet from me. And he was so bright that I couldn't see his face. And I couldn't see his body. All I could see was that he was wearing a white robe or a white gown of some kind with Mm -hmm. a with a red um, sash around the waist. Mm -hmm. And I could see he was wearing golden sandals. He looked at me and I could and I couldn't see him, but he lifted up his hands and he said, You must tell them. There is no death. Hmm. And so all these years, I have been trying to tell people as much as I can that death isn't real, that hmm. death exists. Wow. Yeah, that part was, I was just blown away by that. And some people said it was Jesus, but I don't know who it was, but he was different than the other people. Mm-hmm. He, he just was, had much more energy, had much more intelligence, much more spirituality about him. Mm-hmm. That you and could he, just feel. Yeah. Yeah. And he just said, tell them there is no more death. There is no death. Wow. I forgot to add one more thing here. Do you have, still have a couple minutes? Absolutely. Okay. Here's one thing I forgot to enter that I have thought about for so long. Remember when I said that you can do anything you can you can paint you can ride bikes you can build you can be a carpenter you can mm-hmm. do anything you want to do there are also people over there who specialize in knowing about uh, knowing about certain certain aspects they're historians they're historians of maybe the late 20th century or they're historians of world war 2 you can go to these places over there and visit with them and also learn. So there are many ways for people to learn. Mm-hmm. The, the very last thing he showed me was a castle. And it was a beautiful castle. The kind of castle you see in England has all the stones, has all the rocks, has all of the, the beautiful flowers and plants outside. And he said, let's walk in. So I walked in, and everywhere that I could see, there was red carpet on the floor, like what you'd see nowadays with mm-hmm. castle, red, beautiful carpet. Mm-hmm. And on the walls of this castle, there were life-size paintings of the people that had lived in that castle, the royals. The queens, the kings, the princesses, the princesses all had these life, 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 um, what am I trying to say? Life size. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. They all had life size paintings. So you walk in and you can see these paintings on the wall all the way down for how, how, for us, how many people lived in that time period. So, on the first right to the left, these pictures were life-size paintings of these people, and they were dressed in the clothing that they wore during that time. Mm-hmm. And this is another way 
that people on the other side go and learn. Not only can they go to the past life area or go to that room that was in the, in the, in the um, library, they can go and see the physical history of what a castle looked like because everything that was beautiful on the other side was duplicated here on the earth plane. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, this, so this castle, as beautiful as it is, isn't here because it was built first on earth. Right. It, you know what I mean? It came yeah. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's when we get backwards. I think we think that we, we invented things here and it's kind of like the other way around. Yeah, that's exactly it. Exactly. Yeah. So here's the part that was just absolutely amazing to me that I, I still to this day can't figure out how this works in front of each painting. Look, let's say it was King George, for example, King George would have his clothing that he wore back then and his face was painted so that you could see what it looked like. Mm-hmm. Well, right in front of every single painting, there was a, there was a podium or a lectern and there was a, there was a book on it. Mm-hmm. So I walked over and I looked at this book and the book contained the lifetime of King George. It was written Every single thing that he believed was written down. His childhood experiences were written there. So if you wanted to go learn about George, King George, you can go to this library, the one that he grew up and lived in, look at this book and learn all about him because nothing is hidden. All, all knowledge is somehow by God is recorded. So you could go there and it even had conversations that he had had with other people in that, in that castle. Wow. It was, that, yeah, it was that detailed. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was really designed to look at the decisions that he made when it came to war. Again, it was all about, okay, what did this King do when it came to war or when it came to making decisions for his people? Was he being selfish or was he actually helping his people? Wow. So all of these things are in there or in all of these different books. And that was the last thing he showed me. Wow. So um, at some point, were you given a choice to come back or how did, how did you transition out of this place? I didn't, I didn't get a choice. The very second that, um, and the the last thing that the last thing I had was when the person told me, you must tell them there is no death. Mm Mm-hmm. The very second he said that, I woke up back in the hospital mm-hmm. with these doctors all looking down at me. And we, he said, he's back, he's back. Hmm. And I was, I was physically dead for six minutes. Oh, wow. They, yeah, and, and that's the crazy thing I, I don't understand is it felt like what he took me on was a two-hour journey of the other side. Yeah. Because it, it felt that long. How could he possibly have showed me all of those things in six minutes? Yeah. So the time, somehow the time is different there. Yeah. Like it doesn't exist here. And they were just amazed that I came back at all after having the, the elective surgery to my hands. So it was just, and I, I think it had been two weeks for me to actually try to understand what I experienced. Mm-hmm. I, I went to libraries and trying to find books on near-death experiences. And there really weren't very many at the time, but I found a couple and yeah. I, began to, I began to realize that that's what I had. I had a near-death experience. What year did this happen, John? I don't know the year, but it was, oh, it was um, 1985. Okay, so eighty-five. So yeah, near-death experiences were not well known then. I mean, that was yeah. that was there were just starting to be some some books about it. Yeah, yeah, Raymond Moody's books, Life After Life. Yeah, but I, I was absolutely blown away, and I I really hope that this information, the experience that I had, will help you and your listeners. It was so profound, and it was so it's so much a piece of my life now that I yeah. share with almost anybody that I, who wants to hear about it because that's what he told me. 
Yeah. Well, it's, it, it does. It helps so much. And um, I've listened to many near-death experiences. Yours is one of the more detailed ones I've listened to. And it explains so much of what, you know, we, we're trying to piece together. Like, what's what's this tunnel thing? You know, what is this tunnel that, that some people experience, but not everybody experiences? Exactly. You, you even said that the orientation, not everybody has to go through that. And the different aspects of the other side, because I've heard people say, well, if it's a real place, then why do people see different things? Well, they're different. They're, you might end up in a different place when you yeah. happen to, to land there. Um, so, yeah, it, it's very, very um it's very comforting. It's very reassuring. It, it explains, you know, reincarnation and why we might do that. Um, I, I know soul planning is a new concept for a lot of people. And some people really struggle with it because they say, well, if I plan this life, I certainly wouldn't plan it this way. Um, exactly. But it's a different perspective when you're over there, right? Because we're, we're, we're coming here for a goal. Yeah. And what's so interesting is that when you're on the other side and you plan out a lifetime, your lifetime seems like it's only two hours or two weeks Hmm. when you may have a lifetime that lasts until your age 80, but over there, because there's no time, they don't think that way. Yeah. They, they just think, I want to go in and learn this lesson. I want to know what this feels like. I want to grow from it. And that's why I think sometimes people take on too much because they know in, in a perfect environment, like the other side, you know that your lifetime is only going to be a little while. But over here, when you get here, a lifetime seems like a real long time. But to them, it doesn't. Yeah, I think of this, I'm starting to think of this as kind of like VR. It's kind of like virtual reality. And so when we go, when we sit down to play a game, you know, the game time is totally different than the time that in the the room that we're in. So we say, I'm going to play this game, but a lifetime in a game. So we we look at this from the other side. I I just imagine we're thinking, okay, well, I'm going to live about 80 years. That's, you know, maybe you don't even have a concept of time when you're over there. It's just like, yeah, about 80 years. I'm going to do this, this, and this. And yeah, I'm going to plan this. I'm going to be poor my whole life. That'll be fun. Um, (laughs) And I I, I remember I interviewed Natalie Sudman. Do you know Natalie? Natalie is? No, no. She had a near-death experience. She was uh, blown up in, a, in an accident in, I think it was Afghanistan, but it was an uh, improvised uh, IED explosion. Yeah. And so she finds herself on the other side and she goes through these different environments. And the last environment she's in, she's actually planning out her injuries. So she's with these other people. She's, I'm going to come back and I'm going to have these injuries. And she's like, wouldn't it be fun like if she didn't have a leg? Or what if she was blind? And she said she even ex- kind of describes it in a third person kind of thing. Because she's like, when I was over there, I thought all this stuff would be really cool to experience. Um, but when we come back into the body, we're like, oh, now I have to live with this. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. exactly. I'll, I'll go look her up. Oh, her book is incredible. It's called The Application of Impossible Things. Uh, she had a really oh. profound experience. But it also reminds me of my daughter, uh, my daughter who passed away, Shana. When she was young, she I remember she said very clearly one time, I like to, I like to break my leg. And we said, why would you want to break your leg? She said, I want to know what it feels like to walk on crutches. And uh, we were like, Shayna, don't don't say that. Well, it was a few months or years later, she tore her ACL and was in a cast for like three weeks. And then she had to walk. Then she had to have surgery and she ended up walking on crutches. But so my uh, son had ACL surgery. Oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah, I think um, I, I, I really appreciate you sharing this because I think it's so profound. And I think it's so helpful for people well, to understand. Yeah, it really puts it really puts this life in perspective. And if, I think if we can keep it in perspective and keep in mind that that is our true home. That's where we are. This is this is a training ground. This is a, a place we come to learn. Then maybe you can make it a little bit more tolerable, tolerable for Absolutely. people. That, that's wonderful. I think you're right. Well, John, uh, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, it's, it's great to, to have you on and to share your story with, with so many people that, um, you know, hopefully this will go, this will go far and wide. So yeah. uh, you, you enjoy your rest of the day and thanks for being here. Yeah. You too, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. All right. You have a good one. You too. Talk to you later. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I want to make it really easy for you to reach me. So just send me a text to 31996 and simply text the word growth, G-R-O-W-T-H. In fact, you can right now just say, hey, Siri, send a message to 31996. And when Siri asks you what you want to send, just say growth. You can do the same thing with OK Google. Thanks a lot. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to Grief to Growth. Brian hopes that you find this episode helpful 
and we'll come back for future episodes. Brian's best-selling book, Grief to Growth, Planted Not Buried, is a great resource for anyone who is coping with grief or knows someone who is. If you enjoy the podcast and would like to support it, there are three things you can do to help. The first is to share the podcast with someone that you think it will help. The second is to go to iTunes, rate, and review the episode. The third way you can support the podcast is by becoming a patron. Head over to www.patreon.com slash grief to growth. That's patreo dot com slash grief, the number two, growth, and sign up to make a small monthly donation. Patrons get access to exclusive bonus content and knowledge that you are helping to spread the message of grief to growth. For more about Brian and grief to growth, visit www.grieftogrowth.com. Hi there. I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of the podcast, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. What questions came up for you? What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? I invite you to visit us at grieftogrowth.circle.so. That's grief the number two growth.circle.so to continue the conversation with me and with other listeners. It's a space to sound off, to share reactions, and to go deeper into the topics from the show. I look forward to chatting more, and I hope to see you there.